Welcome to this inspiring video featuring the late Jim Rome. In this video, Jim shares his insights on the seven skills that brought him the most success in life. He believed that success is not just a matter of luck or talent, but rather a result of consistent efforts, discipline, and the acquisition of certain skills that can be learned and mastered over time. Through his captivating storytelling and practical advice, Jim will guide you on a journey of self-discovery and empowerment, showing you how to unlock your full potential and achieve your wildest dreams. So, sit back, relax, and let's dive into Jim Rohn's seven skills for success. Let me quickly give you now a list of the skills that changed my life forever. Right, I knew how to milk cows, but it didn't pay well. Here's the first skill I learned to change my life. Getting a customer. Making a sale. If you share a unique product, talk about its merits, persuade someone that it's the best, they agree to buy, that's the simple art of sales. So we're not talking like high-powered spacecraft technical skills here. It's simply sharing something you've discovered with someone else and doing it well enough to where they agree they would like to participate. Now here's what happened when I learned sales. It multiplied my income by five. Now it didn't take that much because I wasn't doing that well in farm country, but it did multiply my income by five. Sales, getting customers, laying that incredible foundation for an entrepreneurial career. So now I've got two skills, milking cows and making sales. Here's the next one I learned that changed me forever, and that's recruiting, introducing the business opportunity to new people, learning how to give a good invitation, learning how to give two kinds of presentation, formal and informal. And the third part of recruiting, of course, is following up. Once you start a new life, now you've got to take care of it, like a new mother would take care of her baby. You don't start a new life and abandon it. You start a new life and nourish it like a mother and protect it like a father. You got to be mo both mother and father to a new person. Nourishment, ideas like a mother. Protection, help defend your new life against the encroachment of outside voices that would try to talk them out of it. So you got to be mother and father in this art of recruiting. We call it being a sponsor. And being a sponsor is like being a bridge, helping somebody from darkness to light, from skeptic to faith, from not knowing to knowing, from no confidence in themselves to starting to gain confidence. You're the bridge that helps people from the shadows to the sunlight. It's one of the most exciting positions to occupy in all of network marketing industry, is the bridge, helping people crossing the bridge out from discouragement into recognition. Being this bridge, that's what the recruiting magic is all about. You've got the answers. They've been looking for the answers. You've got the answers. And you help them cross this bridge. You see something in them before they can see it in themselves. You assure them that it's possible to be more than they are. Therefore, they can earn more than they've got, have more than they possess. This is one of the great arts in the world. And here's what's exciting about this art. It pays big money. Because now you operate a unique philosophy taught first in the Bible. John Kennedy taught it in his inaugural speech. Zig Ziglar's got one of the best ways to put it. And that's the secret to wealth. The secret to wealth and fortune. First taught in the Bible. Because the question was asked, how can we achieve greatness? Great wealth, great power, great influence, great recognition, great self-esteem. How can we achieve greatness? The master teacher was asked. And here was his formula for achieving personal greatness. He said, find a way to serve the many. For service to many leads to greatness. For those that are interested. Some people aren't interested, but for those that are, service to many leads to greatness. Someone says, well, best I can do is just take care of myself, which is okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Somebody says, I got enough bills of my own, I can't worry about someone else's bills. That's okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Greatness is helping people pay their bills, you forget about yours. Because if you help enough people pay theirs, yours disappear. Help people with problems, your problems disappear. The key to greatness, the master teacher taught, is finding a way. Now, a lot of people would like to serve many people, but they don't have a way. 
And what's exciting about you and your business is you've now got the way. Whether you use it or not, it's up to you. Whether you cash it in or not is up to you. Whether you make a fortune or just a little, that's all up to you. Each person's ambition, it's called the same marketing, the same product. These products are the same for everybody here. The marketing system is the same. The difference is each person's philosophy and each person's individual ambition. But whatever your ambitions are, now you've got the ways and means. And here's what you've got the ways and means to do. Serve as many people as you would like. Now, here's what's exciting about recruiting. With what you're involved in here, you can directly and indirectly affect the lives of dozens of people. Some of you are going to directly and indirectly affect the lives of hundreds of people. And some of you, if you wish, can directly and indirectly affect the lives of thousands of people. And the pay is accordingly. If you affect a few, you earn that pay. If you affect the many, you earn that pay. But the secret is found in the Bible. Service to many leads to greatness. Now, John Kennedy said it in his inaugural speech. Here's what he said. Don't ask. Don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? Where is John Kennedy and his philosophy? John Kennedy said, don't ask. That's important if you understand philosophy. He said, don't ask what the people can do for you. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Don't ask what the government can do for you. That's not how you get rich. That's not how you have high self-esteem. That's not how you get trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace, asking what the people can do for you. Don't ask, he said, what the people can do for you. But ask, what could I do for my country? And the country means the people. What could I do for the people? I want trophies. I want recognition. I want high self-esteem. I would even like, like a chance to make a fortune. John Kennedy says it's easy. Don't ask what the people can do for you, but ask, what could I do for the people? Could I directly and indirectly serve many in my country? Now, Zig probably said it best. Zig says money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. <laughs> Zig, you're right. Zig says, my dentist told me, Zig, only floss the teeth you want to keep. You know, forget the rest. But here, Zig is famous for this now. This is one of Zig's philosophies, and it goes right along with the other two, the Bible and John Kennedy. Here's what Zig says. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, wanting everything you want, we call that self-interest. But it's, it, it's okay to have self-interest if you do it in a positive way. By helping enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, you can accomplish all that by learning this next skill called recruiting. And I learned it, and it made me fortunes. So now I've got three skills, milking cows, making sales, and recruiting. Here's the next skill I learned that paid big money, organizing. Once you got a few, get them to work together, see, and that's magic. Getting people to work together is magic. Now, yes, it's challenging, like having some, you know, several in members of your family, getting them to work together is challenging, but it's magic. Getting husband and wife to work together is challenging, but it's magic when it happens. But everything magic is challenging. Just got to jot that down. Everything magic is challenging. But once you figure out the challenge and go for it, then the magic occurs. Let me tell you how magic, how magical people working together is. Let me quote the Bible again. It says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Just try that on for your mental size. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. Everybody's looking for a challenge. Here's what I teach, especially the kids. Here's the best challenge in the world. Let's go do it. Not you go do it. Let's go do it. If two or three of us decide on a common purpose to do it, nothing's impossible. Incredible. Working together, organizing. Now, when everybody's an independent, now it's a little more challenging. Like having kids, they've each got their own opinions. They've each got their own uh, ambitions and desires. It, it's, it's challenging. You've got a variety. But that's what makes life the variety. And it is in your business, it is challenging, getting people to work together. It's like herding cats. 
You know, sheep are easy. Sheep are easy. But you got to try cats, herding cats. <laughs> but if you can possibly get it done, the power is so immense when you get people to work together. Here's one of the powers of working together, shared testimonials. If I've got somebody new and you're there and I'm there, I give them my testimonial, you give your testimonial. Maybe what tips the scales in getting me a new person is not my testimonial, but my partner's testimonial, somebody I'm working with. Their testimonial got them. Shared testimonials are so powerful. That's why getting working together is okay, is powerful. Now, working by yourself is okay. All this stuff is okay. Everybody needs to know, though, where are the advantages? And these are some of the advantages. I learned to organize, paid big money. Here's what I next learned to do. Promote. Promotion now pays staggering money. Now, the company comes up with what we call major promotions. Here's what you've got to come up with. The smaller promotions. The company comes up with major recognition. You've got to come up with small recognition for your people around you. The top five. The company's got top five. You've got your own top five in maybe two or three categories. Top five, top five, top five. And those little recognitions to reach certain levels in the company, you have to take major steps. But for you, recognition, let them take small steps. Here's one of the secrets of your kind of business. Rewarding people for small steps of progress. Rewarding people. Sometimes it's just recognition, handshake, pat on the back. Mary, you're doing a fabulous job. And you figure out what those recognitions are. Small steps of progress. Guess what promotion pays if you learn it well? Big money. Getting people to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do by themselves. People will do some unique things by themselves, but if you can figure out a way to say, Mary, if you do this and this, she says, well, I'll go for it. Now, she, she wouldn't have thought of that on her own. Here's what works magic. It's better than money. Money's a bit unimportant. Here's what's important. Ingenuity. The best place to wake up your ingenuity is what you're doing right now. Representing a unique product and getting customers, recruiting distributors and promoting and all this stuff. Ingenuity, figuring out a way. If it doesn't work this way, we'll work another way. I used my ingenuity, made a fortune. I learned promotion and it paid big money. Here's the next I learned, communication. How to conduct a meeting. I learned identification, logic and reason. Attack and confess. Solution, simple deals on communication. Wasn't easy for me at first. I stood up to give my first presentation, my mind sat back down, <laughs> right? Y'all been through that? Opened my mouth, nothing came out for a while. But here's what I did, I did it again. Just jot that phrase down, I did it again. That's the secret to how I got here. 35, 40 years later, it's how I got here. I did it once, it was uncomfortable. That first presentation was so lousy if I hadn't have been doing it, I'd have gone home. <laughs> it was not that good. But here's the secret to how I got here. I did it again, and then I did it again, and then I did it again, and I did it again. I remember when I first decided to be a little more animated, right? And walk out away from the podium, right? Get out from just behind the podium. So I got out there, and then I thought, how do you get back? <laughs> Whoa, I'm stranded out here. Remember those times? Doing something for the first time? So learn communication. How to affect other people with words. That's the greatest art in the world to learn. How to affect other people with words. Key phrase, don't be lazy in language. If you learn to use the gift of your own language wisely, it can make you a fortune and build an incredible life. Here's three other things I learned. One is to train. Training people how the business works. And then I've used another word called teach, train and teach. And only to say this, training people how the business works, teaching is how life works. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century, business skills and life skills. The life skills are leadership skills. The life skills are learning how to set goals. Now here's the ultimate skill to learn that can transform your life and the life of whoever will listen. The ability to inspire. Inspire means help people to look up a little higher than where they are and wish they could get there and inspire them that it's possible. Here's how we inspire, by our own testimonial. If I can do it, you can do it. Here's how else we inspire, by others' testimonial. If they can do it, Mary, you can do it. Getting people to see themselves better than they are. Getting people to see themselves richer than they are. 
getting people to see themselves more capable next year than they are this year, getting to see themselves in the future. To help both your kids and your people, here's what you must learn to do. Number one, help people to see themselves as they are. If people have made mistakes, they got to know it. You can't go on making mistakes and hope to achieve. Mistakes have to be corrected. And you've got to do it with your children, help them to see themselves as they are. If they've messed up, here's what you've got to say. You've messed up. But here's what's important as a parent. Don't leave them in the mess. Some parents, you know, tell their kids they've messed up and then they leave them in the mess. They don't paint a better picture. Here's what you could become with just a couple of more changes. Rather than this, here's what you could be. So we must help our children see themselves as they are. But here's the greatest gift to help our children see themselves better than they are. To transport them not only past to see their mistakes, but transport them to the future to see their opportunity. To see the person they can become. My mentor had that greatest gift to help me to see myself better than I was. At first it was difficult to see. Then I started to believe. And that's how I got here today. He said, one of these days, Mr. Owen, you'll walk into a room full of people and you will hear some of them say, that's him. That's the famous man. I, I said, well, that could never happen to me. He said, trust me. If you keep working hard on the disciplines like you're doing right now, that'll happen. You'll walk into a room full of people and you'll hear one say, that's him. That's the famous man. He saw it and he tried to get me to see it. And now finally it's happened. I think when I walk in here today, I think I heard someone say, that's him. That's the famous man. <laughs> and if it can happen for me, it can happen for you. Just master these skills to inspire. Here's what else I, I learned, the skills of building an organization. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. You must be like life itself. Respond to deserve, not to need. It doesn't say if you need, you will have a harvest. It doesn't say if you need a harvest, you'll have a harvest. It's not what it says. It says if you plant, chances are good you'll have a harvest. If you plant, you will reap. Not if you need, you will reap. So we must be like life itself. Respond to the people who deserve it by planting, by taking the first step. Even God himself says, if you move toward me, I'll move toward you. That's the condition. You move toward me, I'll move toward you, says the Almighty. Now, he could also say, you don't move, I don't move. You say, well, that's arbitrary. Well, when you're God, you can set it up that way. <laughs> now, learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Now, here's what's the next step. Teach people how to deserve your time. Teach people how to deserve your attention. Teach people how to deserve a phone call. Say, Mary, you just take this one step and I take two steps. You take two steps, I take five steps. You don't step, I don't step. But this isn't hard now. You step, I step. You respond, I respond. You try, I try. You make a call, I back you up. Right? Learn to teach people how to deserve your time and your attention. Next, I learn to work by group more than individual. Here's why. 80% of the people do 20% of the business. So 20% of the people you can work with individual, 80% you have to work with by group. But group is very powerful, less confrontational. Then here's what's important for all of you to learn. You can help a thousand, but you can't carry three on your back. You can help a thousand, but you can't carry three on your back. And I'm sure all of you have already gotten that experience, even though you've been here a short time. Some people will try to get on your back. That's where we got that expression. Get off. We're... That's where we got that. A guy discovered somebody on his back and said, what? I can't carry you. Get. Now, if you're like some I see here, you know, six foot four and you weigh 300 pounds, you might carry one. And if, if you were really big enough, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or something, you might carry two, but you can't carry three. When babies are born, they were not designed just to be carried. Babies were not born to be carried all their life. Someday you got to try your legs. Someday you got to try your wings. Someday you got to try 
Even if you fall down, you got to try because you can't just crawl around all your life. You can't be carried all your life. So as quickly as possible, you can help a thousand, but you can't carry three. Next, don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. I used to try to change everything. You can hang apples on a pear tree. I'm telling you, it won't help. You can put up a sign, this is an apple tree. Sure enough, come the season, pears. Here's what I learned. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. Incredible. Capital in your business isn't what matters. Okay, it's not the money that buys you a future. It's your skills that buy you a future. Money and no skills, and I'm telling you, you're still poor. Money and no ambition, where are you? Money and no courage, you're broke. A little bit of money and a whole lot of courage, that's all we need. I'm looking for people when I'm recruiting back in those days, and the money didn't matter. What mattered to me was somebody's willingness, somebody's ingenuity, somebody's willingness to try, right? If they had a dollar to invest, that was plenty for me. A dollar and some ambition. And I can show you how to get rich. And it'll be one of the classic stories of the company. I go to recruit somebody. They say, I don't have any money. See, I've been looking for you for six months. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you how to do it without any money. Because here's the rules of capitalism. Got this down. You can either buy and sell, or if you're in certain circumstances, you can sell and buy. If you've got ambition. Now, if you haven't got ambition, we can't cure that. And money won't cure lack of ambition. But if you've got a dollar and some ambition, I'll show you how to get rich. And even if you don't have a dollar, I'll show you how to get rich because you can sell and buy. Somebody says, as soon as the product arrives, I'll sell it. Then you don't understand. You don't understand the magic of fortune. If you say, I have to wait till it gets here to sell it. And you probably don't understand the value of your own story. Once I understood that, I knew I was going to be wealthy. That's why right in the beginning, I started giving big tips. I knew I was going to be wealthy. Say, wow, this guy tips like a rich man. Said, That's right, he tips like a rich man. <laughs> Even in the beginning, I tipped like a rich man because I knew I was going to be. Now, jot down these five key ideas. Here's number one, work on your personal philosophy. The first thing you start changing is what? Your philosophy. You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information. Gather new knowledge, make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change. Your relationship with your family will change. Your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. I'm telling you, income, promotions, all of it will change. If you will change, it'll all change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope they'll straighten it out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, Wishing for the wind to change in your favor, we call naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25 and it revolutionized my whole life. My mentor said, Mr. Owen, you've been working six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. He said, couldn't we go over the last six years and find out where your errors in judgment were? And couldn't we correct those and invest that correction in the next six years? I said, I guess we could. That's how I went from pennies to four. Incredible. Only humans can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. <laughs> right? If you used up all the nourishment around you, couldn't move, then you would die. But that's not true. So however little what much you want to change, that's up to you. But see, if there's a class and you don't take it, and a skill and you don't learn it, and a discipline and you don't try it, and if there's a possibility and you don't explore it, then who are we going to blame? Nobody but yourself. You know, we put some of the valuable things on the high shelf, so you can't get to them until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you've got to stand on the book you read. Every book you read, you get to stand a little higher so you can get the things on the higher shelf. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They gotta know. They just read, 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 read. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger? More decisive. Be a speaker, be a leader. Have a better effect on other people. Develop your personality. 
Did you know there's books on that? And people don't read them? How would you explain that? And they can read? Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key, every day, don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. And also remember to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Mr. Shof got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. Shof recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now I had a Bible, that's 66 books. So that was a pretty good start. But the first book Mr. Shof told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, it's a great one to add to your library. I read it several dozen times. Shof said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shope, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. Here's the next one, attitude. Attitude. It is our attitude toward life which will determine life's attitude toward us. Now let's talk about the attitudes of people who are successful. Successful people come in all shapes and sizes and in widely varying degrees of intelligence, background, and so on. But they all have one thing in common. They expect more good out of life than bad. They expect to succeed more than they fail. If you want something worthwhile, Take the attitude that there are a lot more reasons why you can have it than there are that you cannot, and set out to earn it. Go after it, work at it, ask for it, and nine times out of ten, you'll get it. Now, let me tell you of a little test you can make which will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that a good attitude can change a person's life as dramatically as walking from a darkened room into the bright, clear light of day. So here's the test. For the next 30 days, act toward the world, everything and everyone with whom you come in contact, with the attitude which represents the kind of results you want to achieve. That is, if the result you want is more success in what you're doing, act as though you are already in possession of the success you seek. If you want others to treat you with admiration and respect, treat others with admiration and respect first. Have you ever stopped to think of this? Every human being on earth is the most important human being on earth as far as he or she is concerned. You may never get anyone to admit it, but it's a fact. So for the next 30 days, treat every person with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. 
remembering as you do so that as far as that person is concerned, he is. Now, the reason I say treat everyone in this fashion is mainly because this is the way human beings ought to treat each other and because it will help you form a habit that will bring you amazing and delightful results for the rest of your life. Have you ever noticed that the higher you go in any organization of value, the nicer the people seem to become? You see, the bigger the person, the easier it is to talk to him, to get along with him, to do business with him. Do you know why? It's because he's got a good attitude, and people with the best attitudes just naturally gravitate toward the top. So for 30 days, act toward others and the world at large in exactly the same manner you want the world and others to act toward you. Treat your wife or husband as the person he or she really is, the most important person in your life. And the same with the children. Carry out into the world each morning for 30 days the kind of attitude you would have if you were the most successful human being on earth. And notice how it quickly develops into an habitual attitude. When a person does this, he should realize he has already placed himself on the road to what he seeks. He is right now in the top 5% of the people in this or any other country. He has prepared the ground and planted the seed. He has made of himself a magnet, an embodiment of that which he seeks. Before metal can be cast into a desired shape, the mold, the expectant receptacle, must first be fashioned. Before a building can be erected, the excavation must be made and the foundation laid. And before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs as would the person he wishes to become. He is then actually that person, and the things that person would have and do will naturally come to him. Almost immediately, a change will be noticed. Irritations that used to frustrate and annoy disappear. When some less informed individual gives you a bad time, stay on the track. When someone cuts in front of you with his car or acts in any other manner that shows his ignorance and lack of courtesy, don't permit yourself to drop to his level. Pity him, for that's what he really deserves. That's the very group a person doesn't want to belong to. And if he acts like them, well, let's face it, he belongs with them. There's nothing in the world that men, women, and children want and need more than the feeling that they're important, that they're needed and respected. They will give their love, their affection, their respect, and their business to the person who fills this need. So the magic word is attitude. And in summing up, a few points to keep in mind. One, it is our attitude at the beginning of a task which more than anything else will affect its successful outcome. Two, it is our attitude toward life which determines life's attitude toward us. Three, we are interdependent. It is impossible to succeed without others. And it is our attitude toward others which will determine their attitude toward us. Four, before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs as would the person he wishes to become. Five, the higher you go in any organization of value, the better will be the attitudes you'll find. Six, your mind can hold only one thought at a time. And since there's nothing at all to be gained by being negative, be positive. Seven, the deepest craving of human beings is to be needed, to feel important, to be appreciated. Give it to them, and they'll return it to you. Eight, look for the best in new ideas. As someone said, I've never met a person I couldn't learn something from. Nine, don't waste valuable time broadcasting personal problems. It probably won't help you. It cannot help others. Ten, don't talk about your health unless it's good. Eleven, Radiate the attitude of well-being, of confidence, of a person who knows where he's going. This will inspire those around you, and you'll find good things will begin happening to you. And twelve, lastly, for the next thirty days, treat everyone with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. If you'll do this for thirty days, you'll do it for the rest of your life. Now here's the third of the five ideas, number three, and it's called lifestyle. Because the essence of life is not a Ferrari or a bank account. It's not a million dollars. Here's the essence of life. Learning to live a good life. Don't just learn how to earn. Learn how to live. Mr. Shelf taught me lifestyle in those early days, starting with small amount. He said, imagine that you're getting your shoes shine, and the shoe shine boy has done a fabulous job. So you pay him for the shine. Now you consider from the change in your hand what kind of tip to give him. 
and the question pops into your mind, shall I give him one quarter or two quarters for my neat shine? Mr. Schultz said, if two amounts for a tip ever come to your mind, always go for the higher amount. I said, what difference would that make? One quarter or two quarters? He said, all the difference in the world. If you said, well, I'll just give him one quarter, that will affect you for the rest of the day. You will start feeling bad. Sure enough, in the middle of the day, you will look down at your great shoe shine and say, I've got to be cheap, one lousy quarter. That will affect you. However, if you go for two quarters, Schof said you can't believe the feeling you can buy for another quarter. That's lifestyle. So develop your lifestyle a little more. Your style of seeing, giving, sharing, enjoying. It's not the amount that counts, but the experience of choosing to live with style. I remember saying to Mr. Schof one time, if I had more money, I would be happy. And he gave me some of the better words of wisdom when he said to me, Mr. Rohn, the key to happiness is not more. Happiness is an art to be studied and practiced. He said, more money will only make you more of what you already are. If you're inclined to be unhappy, if you get a lot of money, you will be miserable. More money will only make you more. More money will only amplify. If you're inclined to be mean and you get a lot of money, you will be a terror. If you're inclined to drink a little too much, when you get a lot of money, you can now become a drunk because you can drink everything. So style is not more. Style is an art. Here's something else to think about. Did you ever hear where the expression tip came from? As in tipping the waiter or waitress in a restaurant. Mr. Shove taught me that it began as a symbol for the phrase to ensure promptness. Now Shove said, if a tip is to ensure promptness, when should you give it? Answer, up front. See, I didn't know that. I said, no, you have lunch, and if you get good service, you leave a good tip. If you get lousy service, no tip. And he said to me, no, no, Mr. Roan. Sophisticated people don't take a chance on good service. They ensure good service by giving the money up front. I said, wow, what a way to live. I had never thought of that. So the next time you have someone special to take to lunch, call the waitress over, arm around the shoulders and say, here's $5. Would you take good care of me and my friend? Schof said, you won't believe what happened. They do what's known as hover. They hover around your table. Same money, different style. The next one is activity. Now here's an important question. What is your philosophy about activity? What about hard work? What about long hours? What about full days? If you're doing something, how hard should you go at it? How much time should you put in? Everybody has to develop their philosophy about activity because your philosophy of activity will affect the rest of your life. Not to think so is naive. I've got a good clue on rest. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you rest too long, the weeds take the garden in the summer. So you can't rest too long. Life doesn't stand still. And the threat of life will start overwhelming the values of life if you just let it go. So we've all got to have a philosophy about activity. Let me give you one of the best I know. Here's what it says. An ancient phrase says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. That's a philosophy. You say, well, I'm getting by with half my might. Well, okay, but you've got to decide on your own personal philosophy of activity. Now this philosophy says, do it with all your might. They said, what do you think most messes with the mind? I said, I think it is simply doing less than you can messes with the mind. It causes all kinds of psychic damage, I think. Simply being less than you can be, doing less than you could do, trying less than you could try, doing it with less enthusiasm than you could. I think it somehow damages the mind. It damages our self-image. Because here's what I've discovered happens. The minute you turn this around and start extending yourself, 
It isn't the value you get from extending yourself that's the greatest value. It's how you feel about yourself that's the greatest value. Because, see, it's not what we get that makes us valuable. It's what we become. And part of becoming is to see what all you can become. See what all you can do. See how much you can earn, how much you can share, how much you can start, how far you can reach, how far you can extend your influence. Now, here's number five. Measure progress. Because if you're going to play the great drama game of life, the key is to keep measuring progress to see how you're doing. How's your health doing? How's your income doing? How are your investments doing? If you're building a house, how is it coming along? What's going on? Measuring progress. That's what we call the name of the game. Here's how we teach it to our children. You must make measurable progress in reasonable time. Now we must be Uh, this is a good list that I've put together, inspired by a couple of others and my own contribution, and I'd like to share this list with you. First, learning the power of purpose. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, you got to have something on out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. Here's the next one, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily disciplines. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter, it was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. You know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I take the Herbalife products. I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health, it affects your future, it affects your psyche. 
So this is true. One of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes, if I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances, to rise above what happens, the petty little things, the discouraging things that would sink everyone else's ship except yours, that would cause someone else to quit early in the day, but you keep going. That kind of willingness to overcome all circumstances, whether it's the little challenges or the big challenges, if you're willing to do that, I promise you, this kind of power will work for you, and in you, the variable, it'll make a difference. The third on the list I had was enthusiasm. And here's what I wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside, 90%, 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people. That kind of enthusiasm, knowing that you're going to get the job done, knowing you're going to affect people, knowing you're going to have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions. That kind of enthusiasm. A lot of it is quiet. A lot of it is unheard. And the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Next on my list to help you become the powerful variable is expertise. Wanting to excel in all of the skills and settling for nothing less than an outstanding performance. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence in skills, to be the best that you can possibly be. In the training, do the best you possibly can. In doing a workshop, do the best you possibly can. Developing the skills of using your personality, developing the skills of language, developing the skills of influence, developing the skills of organizing. If you're willing to be an expert in all of the skills, Herbalife has the way for you to invest those skills and not only make a handsome living, not only make a lot of money, but if you would so desire and if it would be your purpose, a chance to make your fortune. Expertise, excellence in skills. Here was the next one on my list, making a powerful contribution to you, the variable, and that is preparation. Well prepared. And preparation, of course, involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. When we go to the first grade in school, we're just preparing for the second grade. After we've finished two grades, the two grades prepare us for number three. Sometimes it seems like a long, excruciating time. And the time will just seem like it'll never come when we can finally have the performance that we really want. But it takes time to prepare, it takes time to get ready. And the decisions you make in the preparation time, those are the decisions that last for a lifetime. Preparing to have a good day. It's that preparing, maybe the night before, maybe the couple of days before the day that you're going to put everything together. 
The preparation for a meeting means that you've taken it serious. The preparation for doing a workshop means you're serious about the workshop. You want to make the best contribution. That kind of preparation is important. But here's preparation that's very vital, and that is to prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Life says, why waste a fortune on this person? They're not prepared to do the right things with it. They're not prepared to use it wisely. If a fortune was bestowed upon this unprepared person, it would probably be wasted. The people that could have been touched won't be touched. What could have been done won't be done because this fortune will have been wasted on the unprepared person. So not only look for fortune, not only look for the promise, but prepare yourself and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Every value in life must be paid for. And those that pay are the ones that get it. It says those that give receive. Someone says, I wish to receive, I wish to receive. You don't have to concentrate on receiving. Just become a good giver. It says those that search will find. Someone says, well, I need to find some good ideas to help change my life for the future. Then to find good ideas, that doesn't come because you need them. Because it comes because you search for them. If you want good ideas, you've got to go after them. You've got to go to the class. You've got to go to the workshop. You've got to go to the training. Go to the book, right? You've got to go to the journal. Right? Go where good ideas are being taught. Go searching, go looking, because good ideas are not going to be wasted on those that are not seeking, searching, well prepared. So prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. Opportunity comes along and passes by the person that is not well prepared. I want to prepare myself this year for next year. Yes, I wish to be effective this year, but I'm also thinking of ways. How could I be better? How could my ideas be more powerful? How could they be sharper, more clear? How could I reach some people uh, next year that I perhaps can't reach this year? I haven't reached deep enough into my own soul to affect some people. Some people just pass by and say, hey, what a good speech. But how could I make it stronger than that, deeper than that, more powerful than that? I cannot be as powerful as I could be next year. You know, you can't go to the, to the tenth grade and the fifth grade. You just got to go through the grades. But the more you are prepared, when the tenth grade finally comes, now you can cash in and get two times, three times, five times more value from it by being prepared. I want to do my best this year for Herbalife, but I also want to get ready for next year, 1999. And then when the year 2000 comes at the turn of the century, I want to be well equipped by language, by instinct, by temperament, by personality, by influence to really be valuable the year 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's my goal. I'm sure it's your goal. Now here's the next one. There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. It would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up. I can fill the gap. I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this, never complain and never explain. Here's the next 
key power, and that's image. There's many parts to image. The image that others see you as, the image you have with other people. And it's very important how other people see you. If they don't see you as a leader, chances are they won't pay attention. If they don't see you as being in control, chances are they won't have the trust. If they don't see you as knowing where you're going, what you want to accomplish, they probably won't follow. But if people can see you, if you have the image of someone that's in charge, in control, in control of your life, your future, your destiny, in control of the situation, if they see that, that kind of image is powerful. It helps to win the day. It attracts other people. People want to be around people that are in control, that are powerful, but they know how to use their power. Influential, but they know how to use their influence. That kind of image is important. But here's a very important image, and that is your image of yourself. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning, all of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self-image that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can. Because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. You know, how I appear to other people, that's important. But how I appear to myself is the ultimate importance. That kind of image to where you'll develop the self-confidence, you'll develop the self reliance. Now here's another one in my rather short list. The next word is character. Becoming a person of high values, a person of principles, a person of honesty, a person that earns respect, that kind of character. It took character when Mark started to put the marketing system together. How can we have a system that will build in the integrity that people will know that if this happens, then this will happen. And if this goes wrong, here's the way to fix it. Unless you have the principles and the character and the integrity to put together a viable plan for a wide variety of people, then the system is not going to last very long. And I've been around long enough, and I'm sure you have been around long enough to see a lot of systems that got started, but they failed. And the reason is because they were not constructed with integrity. They were not constructed with character. They were not constructed with doing the right thing. They might have been constructed to take advantage. You know, cash it out as quickly as possible and leave. Mark was involved when others took advantage of him all those years ago before Herbalife. When someone took advantage and didn't have the character, didn't have the principles and didn't have the uh, the character to stay, the character to see it through, the character to do the right thing. So this is important to develop the character within yourself that people see you as honest, as fair, willing to do the right thing, willing to be helpful, but always willing to walk the center line, not to pass the line. When we come to an opportunity like Herbalife, especially uh, multi-level network marketing, it is so dynamic, it is so powerful, and it is so possible in fortune making that sometimes people want to speed up the process by cutting the corners, by neglecting to do the right things, you know, to cheat a little here, cheat a little here, you know, cross the line just a little bit because then, you know, it'll grow faster and you can cash in quicker. Not necessary here. Doing Herbalife right will build your fortune longer and stronger than trying to cut the corners and not doing it right. If, you'll ha if we'll have the integrity that Mark had when he started it and keep perpetuating that, that we will do the right thing by the marketing system, the right thing by uh, a distributor who has a customer and they take care of that customer, that customer belongs to that distributor, that kind of integrity in the marketing system, 
the kind of integrity we have among each other, the kind of character we have to rely on each other, because here's what we cannot do. We cannot do this by ourselves. Mark's got to count on me. I've got to count on Mark. We've got to count on the president's team. The president's team has to count on uh, the chairman's club for advice and counsel. Uh, we have to count on the millionaire team, the tabulator team, the world team. We've got to count on the distributor. We've got to count on the distributor giving the right message to the potential customer. We've got to count on the distributor giving wise counsel to the new recruit, teaching them the right way, the Herbalife way, the principled way, the character way. Vitally important. Building and developing your own character. Now here's another one. It's called self-discipline. Self-discipline, all of us have a challenge with that. Because sometimes it's easy, and especially if you're working hard, doing the best you can, it's easy sometimes to let up and let it go. But remember, so many people, especially now that we're as big as we are around the world, are counting on what we do. At home office, they have to be careful. They have to be disciplined. It's easy for the person who ships the product from Herbalife, says, oh, well, I'll wait until tomorrow to ship it. And then they go home and sleep like a baby. But the distributor who's waiting for that product doesn't sleep that night or doesn't sleep when the product doesn't show on time. But if everybody will have the discipline to say, I will do the best job I can, I will make mistakes, of course, because we're all human, but I'll try to remedy those mistakes and do the best job I can. That kind of self-discipline that understands how important your part is in all of the functions that work. Coming to work on the set here, uh, HBN, there's so many people that play a part. And each one of the parts that are played is necessary to put on the broadcast, make it viable, make it real, make it powerful. Any couple of them missing, and it would be a disaster. But all of it put together, and it works like a charm. Each person developing the self-discipline to do their part, do their job. Here's one more, and that is the power of extraordinary performance and demanding of yourself excellent results. This is so important. If you want to live extraordinary, you must do extraordinary. If you want an extraordinary income, you must do extraordinary things. If you want an extraordinary fortune, you must go with the demands of what it takes to have that fortune. Mark has made such a fortune, it's almost beyond comprehension what the numbers really are. But guess what he has the satisfaction of knowing? He earned it all. If he'd have been lax in the performance, Herbalife would not be here these 18 years later. Herbalife would have been a footnote in multi-level history. But because he performed year after year, the third year and the fifth year, and the seventh year and the tenth year, and the twelfth year and the fifteenth year, and now performing well in the eighteenth year. I'm telling you, that's what makes it such a viable fortune for Mark personally, of course, because he did the job. If we would ask of ourselves that kind of performance, and you've got to ask it of yourself. You know, I can't ask it of you. I would try to inspire you. I would tr try my best to share with you what it might taste like, what it's like, to finally make your fortune, it happened for me. But here's what you must do, you must demand it of yourself. Society does not demand that you not have a heart attack. But if you want to escape having a heart attack, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you take herbal life and improve your health. You have to demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you jog around the block every morning. But if you want good health, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you read a couple of books a week and improve your intelligence and your knowledge. That you must demand of yourself. Society does not demand that you build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. That's not a demand of society. But you must demand it, if you wish it, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you learn a list of ten skills. It's one time I came up with this, the four ifs that make life worthwhile. I think I got this when I was in the Carmel Library. 
Carmel, California, one of my favorite places to study and do a bit of research. And I remember that day when I put this together, the four ifs that make life worthwhile. Speaking of preparation, here's what I said. The four ifs are, number one, if you learn, that makes life worthwhile. You've got to learn. You've got to learn what it's all about. You've got to learn what's going on. You learn by trying. You learn by error. You learn by doing it right. You learn by doing it wrong. You learn from other people's experiences. There's all kinds of ways to learn. Never cease your quest for learning. Never stop learning. It makes life worthwhile if you learn. Then I said, the second if that makes life worthwhile is if you try. You've got to do something with what you've learned. See if you can raise a garden. See if you can start a business. See how quickly you can get promoted. See if you can move up in the next income bracket. See how much you can give away and still have plenty left. See how much you can do. Try it. Just try. We're always telling the kids, right? Try it. Try it. Kid says, well, I'm not sure. I say, well, how are we going to know? you got to try. If I put these two poles up, put a bar across here two feet high, say to the kids, who can jump two feet? Someone says, well, I don't know. I say, well, how are we going to know? You just got to back up and take a run at it. Now, what if you knock the bar down? Does that mean you can't jump two feet? No. So then what do we say? Try it again. That's what Shof said to me. Keep trying. He said there's more than one way up the mountain. Sneak up the back if you have to. <laughs> Keep trying. Keep trying. So that's the second if that makes life worthwhile. If you try it over, try it again, try it another way. But keep trying. The third if that makes life worthwhile is if you stay. Developing staying power, that's one of the big challenges of life. Some people plant in the spring and leave in the summer. <laughs> they don't stay. Or the guy builds a foundation, right? Got a nice foundation. Then he goes off and builds another foundation. And then he leaves that one, goes off, builds another foundation. He's got these foundations scattered all across the country. I've done my share of that. Not staying to finish it and put it together and put the roof on, put the last brick in place, light the fireplace, have a party, celebrate, finishing something. Stay, you got to stay. We asked one of my good friends, Jim Cardwell, in uh, Phoenix one time. I said, Jim, what are you good at? He said, starting over. <laughs> said, That's one of my better things, starting over. He's a character. Asked him if he was good at any particular sport, and he said, yes, skating on thin ice. <laughs> okay. Third if that makes life worthwhile is if you stay. Here's the fourth one. Fourth if that makes life worthwhile is if you care. The incredible capacity for humans to care. But if you care, if you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you'll get incredible results. Now, that wasn't too complicated a speech, right? Just four simple ifs that make life worthwhile. But it does take some time, take some research consciously, get your notepad out, get your journal, read the books. But now then, even though you don't have a speech to give, just get ready for tomorrow's conversations today. Get ready for next month, this month. Get ready for next year, this year. Always be a day ahead and a step ahead and a year ahead in your research and your development, in researching your own feelings and life and what's going on so that no matter what conversation comes up, what chance to communicate comes up, whether it's a business communication or a personal communication, whether it's social, whatever it is, you'll be more ready for it a few months from now than perhaps you are now, just because you're doing it deliberately and consciously. So that's number one, have something good to say. 
first step to good communication. Here's the second step. Say it well. Part of communication is saying it well. And there are some key points on saying it well, having a good conversation that gets your point across, but also gets the job done. Saying it well is a matter of repetition, conscious repetition. Some people say it over and over and over, but they don't get any better at it. But conscious participation, repetition, will help you to say it better. See, my first seminars, they, they were not that good. I'll admit that. But guess what? I did it again with the thought in mind of getting better. I did it again with the thought in mind of getting better. Okay? I practiced it some more. I did it some more. I went over it again. I went over it again. And sure enough, if you do it over and over and over and over consciously with the thought of getting better, guess what? Anybody can get better. People, people often wonder why I can do the evening seminar, three and a half hours, most of you have been there, and I don't use any notes. Interesting. Once in a while someone asks me, how can you do three and a half hours and you don't use any notes? And it's very simple. Anybody could do it. Guess why I'm able to do it? I've done it a few thousand times. See, if you do something a few thousand times consciously, Sure enough, you will get better and better and better. So whatever you're doing now in the way of communication, the question to ask is, how long do you want it to take to get good at it? You say, well, I want to get good right away. Then you've got to do it over and over and over and over. Repetition helps you to get better. So the second step to good communication is saying it well. Now, there's some other points on saying it well. Here they are. One, say it with sincerity. And I don't know any substitute for sincerity. Almost everybody wants the feeling from someone else that you are being sincere, that you're not playing games with me, that you're really disclosing to me your true feelings, your true awareness, what's going on in your life, in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. Sincerity, there's no substitute for that. Once in a while, someone asks me, when the seminar is finished, they say, look, Mr. Owen, everybody's gone now, just but tell me the truth now. <laughs> <laughs> that story you tell about meeting Mr. Shelf when you were 25 years old, and uh, he hired you, you went to work for him, spent five years with him, he taught you the principles, how to turn your life around. He said, now that's just a story, right? That didn't really happen. Isn't that just a story to make all this sound good? Isn't that interesting that somebody would ask me if that was just a story or not, or if it really happened? To be sincere, it's got to be true. You just can't come up with sincerity telling an erroneous story. Now, you might make it sound sincere, but sure enough, Someday it'll come back to haunt you. Saying it well is saying it sincerely. Saying it well is saying it accurately. You don't want a lack of credibility to creep in to your communication. So you just got to be sincere. Tell the truth. The truth is so powerful, you don't need to dress it up with fiction. Another part of saying it well is saying it with brevity. Don't linger too long on any one point, because I got a good disclosure for you. The human attention span is short. You can't linger too long on any one thing. You've got to move along. So brevity, brevity. I used to tell long, 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 long stories, and I stretched them out so long people forgot the beginning by the time I got to the end. <laughs> and now the end doesn't make much sense, right? Because you can't hook them both up. I just drug them out too long, too long. People get weary. You just got to practice being brief, being brief, being brief. 
Short, short. Attention span is short. The best practice on this is to practice with kids because their attention span is really short, right? And they don't mind telling you, right? You start talking to the kids, right? And kids say, how long is this going to take, right? I mean, <laughs> right away they get the feeling you're going to take 30 seconds. And you should only take 10, right? I mean, they get bored right away. So short, short. Make, make your stories short. Be brief in your illustrations. If you're going to say, let me... Here's something that happened to me one time. Don't give people a feeling now that you're about to launch into a 20-minute story. Just make sure you get the feeling across that you're going to be brief. It isn't going to take long. You're going to get the story across. And I guess part of that is our high-powered, speeded-up way of living, uh, especially in this country. But it is true. If you want to be effective in communication, you've got to be brief. On any one point, you can't linger long. And I think I've lingered long enough on that <laughs> point. Next, saying it well is saying it with style. Now, part of style is your personal style. And this involves a whole lot of things. It can involve gestures. It can involve facial expressions. Uh, you talk with your eyes. You know, you speak with your facial expressions as well as with your words. Uh, some people talk more with their hands. That's part of your style. Uh, gestures, all of that. Now, here's the key on this, is to develop your own style. However, be a student of style. First, have something good to say. Second is to say it well, consciously say it well. Practice saying it well. Get to where the words come more clearly, more freely. Things you used to stumble over when you talked a year ago, you just correct that. You just correct it and correct it so that now it flows better. Shorten the stories used to be long. Now they're shorter. You just do all that consciously, consciously, so that you get better and better at it, saying it well. Okay, here's the third step to good communication. And this is so important. Read the effect you're having. When you communicate, see, that's just major. Study your audience, whoever your audience may be. If it's one of your children, you just study what's happening to them while you're talking. Right? Look in their eyes, look in their face. Analyze what's going on between you and whoever you're talking to, another person, whether it's a business conversation or a social conversation. You've got to be keenly aware of what's happening to whoever you're communicating with. Now, a real challenge is communicating uh, with an audience. We had about 1,200 people the other night in Orange County, right? And I've got to make sure that everybody from down here, down in front, way in the back, how to gather up a thousand people's attention, right, for the three and a half hour period. Now that's a real challenge. I didn't used to be that good at it. In fact, when I first started lecturing, I was hardly aware of my audience. I was so absorbed in my notes and my material, I guess what? They could have all got up and left and I would have never known it. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed them. I'd have just kept right on talking, right? Because I was so absorbed in the material, I was so absorbed in trying to say it right and do it right, that I was not aware of what was going on with my audience. But you've got to read the effect you're having for really effective communication. Now, if it's just an informal communication situation, you can just ask the question, do you read me? Right? Does it make sense? Did I say it well? And you get this feedback right, so you can actually Start checking how you're doing with somebody if it's informal. You can just ask, okay? Now, what you've also got to learn to do is read the, some of the subtle things that are going on with whoever you're talking to. Because especially humans, or especially adults, you know, when we get a little older, we have these tricky ways of, of looking like we're interested when we're really not. And if you want to be a good communicator, you just got to pick up some of those signals. Now, part of it you can pick up by what we call body language. 
some people just sort of quickly disclose their feelings about whether or not you're effective or it's coming across, and they just sort of relay to you by their what we call body language. It's kind of a new study. I haven't studied that much about it, but there is a book called How to Read a Person Like a Book. How to Read a Person Like a Book by Nuremberg. You just might make a little study on that. Now, don't get too involved in it because sometimes you can so watch somebody in the way they blink their eyes and, you know, you're looking at their ears and looking at their hair and you just, now you get too carried away and trying to figure out, you know, all about them. But you can get some indication. But here's what will here's what'll play you good no matter what. It's called just pure common sense. You just look at somebody. You can kind of tell. If somebody just folds their arms and they tuck their head down like this, sure enough, you've probably got some more selling to do. I mean, you've got to pour it on, or maybe you should change the subject, or maybe you should quit, <laughs> right? You just, just kind of analyze, you know, what's going on here, right? You, some things are just fairly obvious. You know, if a guy's leaning toward the door like this, it's probably a sign, <laughs> right? And you say, oh, I got it, right? It's clear. I've got a good word for the common sense approach, and it goes like this. Let the obvious be your best teacher. Whatever you do, don't ignore the obvious. You know, sometimes we say, oh, it couldn't be. Yes, it probably is. <laughs> but adults especially, sometimes this is a bit tricky. People smile, nod their head like this. And they got you shut off, and you just don't know. Okay. Because in good communication, you cannot mistake courtesy for interest. Sometimes people would be courteous, but that doesn't mean they're interested. Now, if you mistake their courtesy for their interest now, see, you've lost the, the hold on good communication. Also, you can also develop... Um, a sense of picking up signals. I think the women probably have it over on the men when it comes to this sort of sixth sense of being able to tell, no matter what it, the situation looks like, women have this uncanny gift. I guess men can develop it, but the women already have it. You know, the antenna is out. I mean, they pick up signals nobody else can pick up. I mean, the men don't have a chance. I think part of it is because until the industrialized society came, uh, women were primarily the protectors. The man was the provider, right? He was gone. He was out there getting the game or whatever, and the woman was the protector. So I think the woman has devised these incredible... Uh, sensitivities to danger and what's going on, what's happening. I, they're uncanny. Even the Bible says there's sheep and there's the shepherd and then there's the wolves. That's what it says. Life is kind of like that, shepherd and sheep and wolves. It says also some wolves are so clever They've learned to dress up like sheep and talk like sheep, I guess. That's what it says. Some are wolves in what? Sheep's clothes. Now, see, you got to be clever. Huh. The man says, well, looks like a sheep, talks like a sheep. Woman says, ain't no sheep. I mean, <laughs> take my word for it. <laughs> but that's that long developed instinct, I guess, right? In the middle of the night, she says, wake up, wake up. Something isn't right out there. He says, uh huh, right? I mean, he's gone, right? She says, no, 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 something, something, right? She just, she has this uncanny sense. So that's part of, you know, being able to read is uh, picking up, Mr. Shove called it signals, 
says we all throw off signals, vibrations. You know, I don't understand all I know about that. But. Have you heard the expression a dog can tell whether or not you're afraid of him? I guess that's true. We throw off a certain kind of signal and they just, animals, right? They just pick it up. They pick it up. They know. And you can't fake them out, right? You can say, I'm not afraid of you. Dog says, who are you kidding? Right? I mean, come on. Okay, being able to read. That's so important, reading your audience. How you're doing. Should you speed up? Should you slow down? Should you change the subject? Should you be a little stronger? Just be more aware of whoever you're talking to. Right? Look a little more intently at somebody. Try to pick up what's happening between you and the audience or the person or the child or the business partner. You can't believe how it will affect your ability to communicate if you'll practice this part of picking up what's happening between you and someone else. Now here's number four. Then we're going to take our first break. The fourth step to good communication is intensity. Strong feeling. Here's what changes the whole effectiveness of good communication. Strong feelings. In affecting other people with words, here's a key breakdown to keep in mind. And it goes like this. To affect other people with words, it's 20% what you know. And it's 80% how you feel. Feelings and emotions changes the whole outcome of communication. Intensity, words loaded with emotion have the best effect. Words might be like a little straight pin, right? When a guy buys a shirt, right? It's got all these little pins in it, right? They were really pinned all together. So you start pulling out all these straight pins. What if I took one of those straight pins and uh, I threw it at you, this little straight pin, and it reached you, hit you in the face or hit you in the arm, hand somewhere, right? You'd feel it if I threw that little straight pin at you. What if I took that straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about that long, right? And I let you have it with that. See, I could drive that pin right through your heart, right? Now, the pin is the words, and the iron bar is the emotions, the feelings, the awareness, the uniqueness of all of that mysterious stuff that humans are made of. If you will learn to put more of you into what you say, put more feelings, more awareness, more uniqueness, strength of character, conviction, strong feelings, whatever that is, just be more aware of putting more of you into whatever you say. That's that iron bar that drives what you say to the heart, to the mind, and gets the job done. Words loaded with emotion. Now, you must also learn to measure your emotions. Okay? You don't want a major outburst for a minor point. Learn to measure it, okay? Some conversations or some points may need, right? Just a mild blend of emotional feelings. And then another point may need a strong one, but you got to learn to measure that, okay? Not too much for something minor. You don't want to shoot a cannon at a rabbit. Right? It's effective, but you've got no more rabbit. <laughs> so learn to measure your emotions. Now, here's something important. Where does emotion come from? Where do our feelings come from? Here's where they come from. The emotions that can really help in all of your future conversations, communication. It's the blend of all of your experiences and how they have affected you. 
the blend of all of your experiences and how they have affected you. That creates now your emotional content, creates your emotional vitality and worth. So that's part of the getting ready experience on the emotional side. Be aware of your feelings. Be aware of your emotions. And as that experience grows, now when you get ready to talk, you've got the blend of knowledge and the blend of feelings to put into your conversation. And that's what creates the power. Now I have one more point and we'll take our break. It says, don't forget to say it. Part of communication is simply being aware that more often than not, things need to be said. It's pretty easy to take for granted, especially the people that are close around us, that they already know how we feel. But you've got to keep expressing how you feel. Here's a good phrase. Actions are no substitute for words. Now, we've used the other phrase, right? That words are no substitute for action. And that's true. Just talk, 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 and not acting. See, that's not good. But here's what else is not good. All of the action and no talk. Make sure that the words accompany the action. Don't fail to say it. Probably one of the greatest difficulties in married life is this breakdown in communication, not clearing the air often enough, not keeping this open dialogue going constantly. One thing I found out, take nothing for granted. Say, well, surely they understand. Well, just explain it one more time. Just say it one more time. Don't take a chance that whether they know it or not, bring up the subject again. Make sure it's clear. It's too easy to let it slide and not make it clear. Especially the people around you. Say, so how often do you have to tell the people that you love, that you love them? How often? Answer, often. Often. We all need reassurance. We all need the, it to be clear and pointed so that we know there are some things you just don't let go. And there are some actions that will only say certain things they won't say at all. You can give somebody flowers, but flowers won't do all the talking. Flowers say, you remembered. That's, about, that's probably what flowers say. But flowers don't say, you do incredible things to me. Nobody affects me like you do. Now, see, flowers will talk, but they won't say that. That's the card you've got to put along with the flowers. Let the flowers say whatever they can say, but then don't fail to put the other words with it because the words are so important. Judy gave me this watch back when I had a birthday in 1972, I believe it was. And it was a neat watch, Le Cool Tray. If all goes wrong, I can cash the watch in and live for a while, right? I mean, <laughs> Judy was always doing things like that. Fabulous watch, neat, neat gift for my birthday. But see, better than the watch was what she wrote on the back. I appreciated the watch, but the words were better than the watch. On the back, she had inscribed, my love for all time. Your Judy, September 1972. See, the watch was neat, but the words, she could have put the words on a Mickey Mouse watch. <laughs> Pardon me, Walt, I didn't mean to downgrade your mouse. But... but see, the words were what was really important. So I'm saying, let actions speak, but make sure the actions don't substitute for the words. Make sure you say it. And if you'll make sure you'll say it, 
you'll get better at it, you'll get the practice, you'll learn to put more feelings in it, you'll learn to say it well, say it better. And this whole process of communication for you, if you don't treat any of it casually, will start to grow. And you will be even startled in the next few weeks, the next few months, at what happens as a result of your future conversations. If you become more aware of these things that we have just talked about, sensitivity, <coughs> fascination, interest, working knowledge, having something good to say, saying it well, reading the effect you're having, and the intensity of strong feelings. Okay, our next subject under communication is how to make a presentation. And whether it's a presentation to a child or a presentation to a business client or a sales presentation or whatever kind of presentation, we're all making presentations all day long, every day, business, social, personal, whatever. I have four parts to the presentation for you to uh, consider. Here's the first one, identification. One of the most important parts of the presentation process is identification. Identification is, for a new person that you haven't met before, it's getting acquainted, it's breaking the ice, it's building a bridge between you and someone else, establishing contact, uh, getting somebody's attention, so it's a very important part of the presentation process. Sometimes those first few seconds, sometimes that first minute is just so important to establishing rapport, establishing contact. Somebody once said, you never have a second chance to make a first impression. So sometimes how those opening seconds go is very important. But that's identification, getting acquainted. Some people find this easy. Some people find it more difficult. What we're doing is, you know, pointing it out so that you can start working on it deliberately instead of haphazardly or instead of just letting it go, wondering why things aren't going well. We just pick it as a part of the presentation so you can go to work on it, identification. In identifying with someone, one of the best ways is to pick something you have in common to get the conversation started with. Somebody mentioned during the break they attended this leadership seminar up at the ranch. Uh, what, you were up there three or four years ago. And everybody got acquainted up there real easy. And the reason is because when you met somebody new, you would say, hi, how are you? Did you get as lost as I did trying to find this place? <laughs> And it just, everybody says, yeah, I got lost too. And that immediately starts this, you know, little more friendly process of getting acquainted simply because you had a recent experience that uh, you could talk about. So identification is trying to find something you have in common with someone else. You want something that makes you real, something that makes you uh, a person that someone would desire to talk to. In the identification process, we use this little mental phrase. We want somebody to say, me too. Say, well, here's what happened to me. Somebody says, well, me too. I got lost. They say, well, me too. Here's how I felt. Someone says, I understand how that feels. Me too. Here's a reaction you don't want, the reaction called, so what? Now, usually, one of the problems in people's trying to identify is they try to impress versus express. Mr. Schof gave me a little counsel on this. Don't try to impress, he said. Rather, learn to express. Express will get you more me too's. Impressing will get you more so what's. 
See, so what puts up the barrier instead of building a bridge? It blocks this flow of communication. Usually when we introduce somebody, the introduction is usually full of so what's. One of the biggest challenges I have in doing seminars is to overcome my introduction. <laughs> usually an introduction, you know, you have to give your list of credits. But when somebody gets through with the, he's president of this and vice president of this and he's got several companies, corporations, does business around the world, those are pretty well so what's. And I guess we, you know, we consider it sort of standard, the so what's. So one of the first things I do when I come up on the platform and, you know, I get the polite applause and I understand it's polite applause. It's just part of the routine, right, that we go through. If you take that serious, you're in trouble, right? But, you know, you get the polite applause. So I walk up after all these credits, right? And I can tell the people are, you know, saying, you know, you know, who is this guy? And is he really all he's cracked up to be, right? You can just feel all this going on in the audience. So I usually try to just, you know, break that down just as quickly as I can by saying something like, uh, I appreciate the warm welcome. Did you hear what the cow said to the farmer on a cold winter morning? Right. Thanks for the warm hand. Right. And it goes over about like it did here, right? I mean, it just sort of, you know, <laughs> hangs out there. And that's to kind of let people know that, you know, we're not interested in the chairman title or the president's title. We're here to just, you know, talk person to person. And part of that is just an attempt to identify, to let everybody know you're not up there to talk down at them. You're not there to try to impress them with your success or anything else. We're there to really share ideas. But that's always a challenge. And every person and every audience is a brand new challenge. Every time you talk with somebody, it's a brand new challenge to identify. Now, here's what you must, must do with someone who you already know. Re-identify. You don't get this identification process once when you get to know somebody and then it's, it's forever over. You must constantly re-identify. No matter how long you've known somebody, they still want to know how, what are you feeling and what's going on with you and what are you thinking and... Right? Everybody wants to know that, even if we've been around somebody for a long time, when you meet somebody. That's why we use those expressions. If we've known somebody for years, if we see them again, we say, how are you and how are you doing? That's to get this thing going, this identification process going between us and someone else. Now, in the identification process, make sure if you tell little stories about yourself in identifying, make sure that they're accurate stories. Part of my identification, I sprinkle throughout the whole evening seminar. My little story about uh, meeting the little Girl Scout, selling me Girl Scout cookies, right? That's just a little story to try to keep identifying with my audience, to keep them on my side, right? That's, that's identification story, right? She gives me this unique presentation, asked me if I want to buy, and I wanted to, but I didn't have $2. Now, see, I can almost hear everybody out in the audience say, well, I know what that's like. I've been caught without any money. I know how embarrassing that is. See, that's an identification story. Somebody says, I know how that feels. And I say, to this day, I can remember the pain. Somebody says, I've had some of that pain, too. I know what that's like. All of that is identification, identification. So you have to re-identify. If you're talking with somebody over any length of time, you just re-identify little stories, things that's happened to you. So go back over your life and pick out the things that will identify with people. Now you've got the challenge of also identifying with a variety of people from different backgrounds and different uh, businesses than your own. And you just learn to do that, different age groups. Part of it is just being more aware of what's going on in the world so that you can just intelligently talk about some things with people from almost any walk of life, okay? Jesus, the master teacher, was probably one of the great identifiers of all time. He had this incredible knack of talking to somebody with language that they understood what he was saying. One day he said to those around him, today I'm going to teach you how to fish. Guess who he was talking to? A bunch of fishermen. He said, gentlemen, today we're going to have some lessons on how to fish. Only 
I don't want to teach you how to fish for fish because you already know how to do that. What I want to do is to teach you how to fish for people. Now see, he couldn't have chosen a better identification. He didn't say, I'm going to teach you how to recruit. I mean, what do they know from recruiting? <laughs> no, no. He said, I'm going to teach you how to fish. Now, when you're talking to fishermen, that's clever, right? You don't say recruit when you're talking to fishermen. You say fish. See, that's incredible. You just learn when you talk to fishermen, talk a little fish talk, right? If you talk to lawyers, just talk a little lawyer talk. I mean, you just learn how, right? Go sit in the courtroom and, you know, learn a little lawyer talk if you're going to talk to lawyers or get in trouble. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> go to court, right? And sit on the witness stand and whatever. Just so that you can learn to identify. See, I've been through it. And I know it. And uh, analyze who you're talking to and see if you can't pick out certain ways to identify. Now, of course, there's some stories that are common to us all. And sometimes it doesn't take much of a story to identify. Here's a good one. How to identify with kids. Let me give you some keys. First, read all their books. One of the best ways to identify with kids is read all their books. If you've got a 12-year-old, you just read all their books so that you know them forwards and backwards. So you can use those books as a means of identification and stories. Say, remember that story, when, when, when? Kid says, did you read that book? I read them all. I know all those stories. And remember when? And you can use a thousand illustrations from those books that you've read to get a point across, to get something across. It's a means of identification. Read their books. Then when you get ready to talk, you've got something in common. They've read the book, you've read the book. And it's loaded probably with illustrations and points and ideas and, and human life stories of disappointment and, and success and failure, all of that. The way to identify is find out what someone else is interested in, find out who they are, how old they are, what they do, what's going on, and see if in your reservoir of experience and awareness you can't find something that will identify and cause this person to say, me too, I understand that, and you've got them coming your way. Then also a way to identify with kids is to remember when you were a kid. See, I don't have any problem talking to 12-year-olds because I remember every day about being 12. I remember all those experiences in detail. The highs, the lows, the exciting times, the desperate times. When I thought the world was coming to an end and when I was riding on top, I remember all those feelings at 12. Did you ever get chosen last? <laughs> that ever happened to you? They're choosing up sides, right? So I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, and you're standing like this. <laughs> See, all you got to do is go back over, go back over, search around in your life. You can find a thousand ways to identify with all kinds of people from your own life experience. You don't have to go anywhere else except to your own life to come up with all kinds of ways to identify with anybody. But here's what you've got to do. You've got to do it consciously, consciously, deliberately. What can I pick? What can I think of that will help this conversation, that will get my idea across? Who am I talking to? Oh, yes, here's what I'll use. Right? Your mind just, like a computer, starts picking up all these things. This is why it's so important to keep a journal. And when you think of a life experience and say, oh, I could use that life experience in a, in a variety of ways. You put that life experience in your journal. You go over it. You, you think about it. Then when you get ready to talk, it's instant recall. You'll, you, you'll remember it. And you can't believe what you can do with people from all walks of life, business, social, personal. If you will learn the identification process, do it deliberately. Pick out things that you have in common, feelings you have in common with everybody. Okay? Identification. And then pick up stories from all kinds of life situations. 
that are similar to yours. Somebody had a feeling of disappointment. You say, I know what that's like, but I'm going to use that story to illustrate disappointment. Just be aware, the movies you attend and the books you read and the stories you hear, be a gatherer of life's experiences so that you can use them all for points of reference and points of identification. When a teenager watches the movie Gone with the Wind, they see one kind of movie. When you're in your 20s and 30s and you see Gone with the Wind, you see a different kind of movie. Right? When you get along into your 40s, 50s, sure enough, it's a different kind of movie because now you're reading between the lines. Now you're sensing what the real tragedy was, what the complications of life were. It's altogether different at 40 than it is at 14. Same movie, only now you're seeing it. You're picking up all the different parts of the story and the feelings of the story. It's getting to you. But that's part of the identification process. Just be more aware of what you see and what you read and what's happening to you so that you say, oh, there's something I could use, there's something I could use. I'll use that. The next time I talk to people like this, I'll tell them this, I'll tell them this, I'll use this story. That's part of the identification process. Build